good afternoon. Uh, I'm Charlie Stainback, uh, the director uh, of the Berman Museum, and as Justin likes to say, the Ariana Grande of uh, Museum World. Uh, it's a joke between me and Justin. And a little girl that little asked girl. me if I was Ariana Grande famous. And I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, I have with us today uh, Justin uh, Pavilla and Emmanuel Ortega. Uh, Emmanuel is the curator of uh, Justin's exhibitions, and Justin is the artist. Um, this uh, exhibition downstairs will be on view until July of the summer of 2019. Uh, and the exhibition upstairs, if you haven't seen it, will be on display until December 19th of this year, 2018. Um, like all of these sort of events, uh, I am required uh, to do two things. First thing is to ask, ask you to turn off your cell phones. Uh, and the uh, second thing is to do a sort of uh, heartfelt, articulate, intelligent introduction of these two people. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that they are just great guys. Uh, Probably some of the nicest people I've ever, I've ever worked with. Uh, Justin agrees. Uh, and uh, this is our first ever podcast at the Berman Museum. I'm not sure it's the first ever podcast at a science college, but I do know it's the first ever podcast here, uh, and hopefully not the last. Uh, Justin is a Los Angeles-based artist. Uh, he actually works uh, around the country as well as in Europe. Uh, done many, many projects, many, many installations uh, like this one here. His technique, uh, I think 100% of the time now, is using the colored paper, <coughs> paper mache uh, technique. Uh, he graduated from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, and I would uh, say that uh, if you're traveling around the country, uh, at some point, uh, he possibly might be showing in one of those one of those cities because he's actually quite busy. He's in uh, New York City right now. He just did the installation in Portland a while back. He's going to Denver uh, in a few weeks. He's going to be working there for a few months. Uh, so he's very, very uh, busy. Uh, we also have uh, Emmanuel Ortega, who received his PhD in um, art history from the University of New Mexico. He is currently a professor uh, in Chicago at the University of Illinois. Uh, and he teaches uh, Latin American colonial art. Uh, he has explored the themes of uh, identity, or race, violence, and class, uh, and the differences in colonial uh, Latin American art. Uh, and he's uh, uh, organized uh, very, uh, very many uh, exhibitions. Uh, I want to say that this program has been co-sponsored uh, with the uh, our Science Institute for Inclusion and Equity, the Association of Latinos Motivated, Motivated to Achieve, and the Gender Sexuality Alliance at uh, uh, Science College. So without further ado, uh, I want to guarantee you this will probably be uh, the happiest hour the most fun hour that you're going to have, maybe all semester. Justin, wow. Emmanuel. Wow. Nice. Clap for us, please. So, uh, before we get started, we're getting a lot of feedback up here, so maybe we can. Can anybody. Am I, is my microphone on? Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? There's feedback yes. from his microphone. So, can I just put it? The audio, are the audio people here? Hello? Can we, can we fix that? Can you just go over this way? I think it's, I think it's good. Enough. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to do this like we're actually doing a live podcast. Um, this will probably come out maybe in a couple months so we can make it like episode 100. We're officially like 94 episodes in. We have over like 112 recordings, uh, but we used to do mini-sodes um, and now we just do full episodes. So has anybody actually listened to Latinos Who Lunch? You don't have to lie. Okay, three people. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs> okay, so um, this podcast is basically started. One, one of our uh, guests here 
has asked us how we started. We met in Las Vegas. We, we uh, both are based there. And um, Pavelito, of course, is an art historian. I'm an artist. Uh, I was working at the Liberace Museum at the time. And um, also, we're gay, if you haven't figured that out. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, your hair looks good today, girl. Thank OK, you. so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we started just getting together, going to, going to lunch, talking, and I'm an avid podcast listener, so um, I said, you know, there isn't really conversations between like twe two queer like artists or that are Latinx. that are Latinx, just talking about whatever. And I am a big fan of uh, epi uh, podcasts like The Read or For Colored Nerds, which is now The Nod. Uh, which were, were black-centric podcasts that, you know, just had queer voices and they were just talking about whatever they wanted. So, I'm like, let's do it. Let's get together and do it. So we started eating lunch. Latinos Who Lunch is based on the term Ladies Who Lunch. And we thought that would be a funny uh, pun, but at the same time tying into the art world because if you look at art history specifically, probably early 20th century. Early 20th century. Thank you. Oh my You're God. welcome. You are. I hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A lot of the tastemakers out there are women, the women that were collecting the art and actually making it valuable and, and establish, establishing major museum collections and they're really never talked about in art history. So um, that kind of gave us a jumping off point. So now we talk every week. This ep episode is released every Thursday. You can subscribe. When you turn your phones back on, subscribe on iTunes or wherever. Yes. yes. You listen to podcasts. Um, so we we'll start every episode by doing our cheesy introduction, so that's how we'll start. And then, um, just like an episode of Mori Povich or whatever talk show, I'm just going like, to point at you to like, make noise so that it sounds good on the recording like you guys are having a good time. Okay? <laughs> so we usually, this is the format, we usually talk about what we ate that day or what we are literally eating. And then uh, we kind of catch up with each other and then we get into some topics. And today we're gonna to get into this installation and uh, different ideas around identity in art history. In the Latinx community. In, in the Latinx community. <clears throat> all right, so y'all ready? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bobby Fogg. And this is Carmelito. And we are Latinos, Latinos Who Lunch. Lunch. A podcast where we talk about important things like breakfast pizza. Yay! <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Good show, good show, good show. That was great. <laughs> I, I am so excited. We're here live at Ursinus College at the Berman Museum in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> happy to be back in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, but girl, I've been living in the Bronx lately, and, <laughs> and also a big shout out to the Bourbon Museum. They were amazing hosts. I was here for about a month in September. August, thank you, uh, and uh, I did this uh, installation here. There's also a show upstairs at the museum that uh, Babalito curated also. Um, we, our names aren't Fabi Fab and Babalito, those are our internet names, but because in the beginning we weren't, we wanted to kind of remain anonymous. Yes. Um, because we say a lot of bullshit on our podcast. We didn't yes. want that to be tied to our names, but now we're okay with it. We're fine. <laughs> um, now we get hired through the podcast. Which is <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, so shout out to Charles Stainback for Charlie for having us here. Um, shout out to everybody that works at the Berman, Teddy Caputo, who helped me install this show. Teddy! Yeah. <laughs> Julie, Catherine, Betsy, shout out to everybody. Okay, let's get into some food. Let's do it. Okay. So I got here last night, and one of the worst parts of traveling. Listen to the fucking privilege. Yeah. Um, one of the worst parts of traveling is um, it's the food. So I had McDonald's in the airport, and I got to my hotel, there was nothing around. Okay. So I went to Outback. <gasps> Bloomin' Onion? No. Oh, girl, I should have done that. <laughs> anyway, so I, I didn't want to spend $30 on a steak 
And so I spent twenty dollars in the pickle chicken. Nice. I had two bites and I put it away. And then I went hot for beer. You 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 cannot buy beer anywhere. No, girl. This is Amish country. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like after nine ten p.m. You can't buy not even at Wegmans. Shout out to Wegmans though. They've got a really great Oreo Oreo selection there. Yeah, really good. The lemon ones. The lemon. The, the, okay. okay. Let's talk let's about this. Okay. Okay. So is anybody fans of Oreos? Okay. So I'm like. I'm trying, I'm like a practicing vegan, but not really, but, um, but Oreos are vegan, by the way. Okay, they make these perfect, this is the perfect Oreo, okay? It's the cake Oreos, the white ones, the thins, with lemon filling in it. And the cookie to filling ratio is perfect. It's a perfect cookie. If you've never had these Oreos, go and get them today. This episode is brought to you by Nabisco. <laughs> so, so let's get into but let's get into the food here. I mean, Collegeville, Pennsylvania does have some great eats. Yeah. So I woke up this morning. <laughs> I, I had I had hotel food. It was bad, bad, but then we were surprised with breakfast pizza. Yeah. What a concept. Yeah. Where is it from? It's from. Has anybody been to the Collegeville Italian Bakery? Yes, it's yeah. the palm, right? Okay, so um, you probably shouldn't go there every day like I did <laughs> because I almost died. Uh, but they have a great selection of pizza, cheesesteaks, um, <coughs> crepes. Oh my god. What else do you eat? They have a Nutella grape, that's all. Uh, oh, oh, wait, what? grape. A Nutella grape, it was oh, so good. Okay, and I also went to this place called Wibs. Have you guys been there? Not That's a gross. lot of big, not a lot of vegan <laughs> options there. <laughs> Guess what Wibs is? What does it stand for? I have no idea. Wibs, wings and ribs. No. Yes, no. it's awesome. It's right down the street. <laughs> you get a half a rack of ribs, some chicken wings. It's the chicken wings are. This is. I'm just gonna talk about like ratios. Go for it. It's like really crispy and really saucy at the same time. Support your local wing place. Everyone. <laughs> Don't fuck around with Buffalo Wild Wings. That's a major corporation. You know how big those wings are? You know those aren't real chickens, right? Like, you shouldn't be eating them. Something but, happened 10 years ago in Mexico, and now you see a wings place everywhere. I don't know yeah. what it is, but it's, in Mexico it's different because it's almost like a status thing. Like, you go eat wings. And it's like the prepping people that go to these. It's the opposite here. And I remember a friend from Honduras who talked about TGI Fridays. TGI Fridays is the place in yeah. Tegucigalpa. It's so weird how those <coughs> corporate places that are everyday food here, they transfer to Latin America, and it's like its own different monsters. Have you ever been to Starbucks in Mexico? Yeah, uh, it was incredible. I didn't know I had to dress up to go to Starbucks. <laughs> um, also, the Burger, Burger Kings are, are the place to be seen Two, three in Northern Mexico. Yes, amazing. yes, the Play Place, it's like you're at a Chuck E. Cheese or something. It's yes, incredible. It's amazing. Um, but I do want to I want I do want to give uh, some shout outs because I did eat in Philadelphia while I was here one day and I went to this place called South Philly Barbacoa. That place is famous. Has anybody ever been there before? Okay, yes. Yes, I recommend it. So yes. Barbacoa. Does anybody know what Barbacoa is? Yes, yes. okay. Okay. <laughs> Describe it, Mamelito, please. Barbacoa, it's the word barbaco, it's a play with the word barbecue. Okay. okay. But it depends on different, um, different parts of Mexico has different types of barbacoa. The way that we eat it is the chivo. Goat. Goat. Goat, yes. But they cook it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. In the north, we eat it dry. So we eat it crispy. In Oaxaca, in Puebla, they add it. They add a lot of sauce. They add like a tomato, chili type of sauce, and it just marinates for hours and hours. <coughs> and eat it, it just falls apart in your. Oh my god! But I don't know how they make it over here. Same way, probably. Yeah. But what kind of the, what kind of barbacoa is it? What what style? I don't know because I'm vegan. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> But if you go there, they only serve the barbacoa on the weekends, okay? But if you go there during the week, there's it's one of those restaurants where they only have like a couple of dishes to choose from, and they change the menu every week. So uh, if you want to make the trek, um, and there's not traffic, it only takes like 50 minutes to get there. It's like, I think it's in Little Italy. Is that technically where it is now? Because the location keeps changing, but the people that run the place 
are Ben Miller and Cristina Mar uh, I think Martinez. And uh, they are going to be on an episode of The Chef's Table, which is uh, uh, David Chang. Uh, it, it, they were on Ugly Delicious before. Anyway, the food is incredible there, so I highly recommend it. Also, the tortillas are the bomb. Okay, so. That's what makes a place. That's the difference between a good place Talk and about an excellent oh. place. Yes. Because you can have the, great, the greatest meat, but if you have the tortilla <coughs> from the store, forget it. But if you see people, you know, yeah. doing yeah. business, yes. Okay, so has anybody here been to Phoenixville? Yeah. Shout out to Phoenixville. There's a bar every 12 feet. <laughs> Y'all are alcoholics for real here. Okay. And <laughs> there's nothing else to do, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, okay. So usually you go to these bars and there's usually a fish taco. And you know, I, I always know when there isn't a brown person as a consultant because they never pay attention to the tortilla. So if you are a person that doesn't know about tacos, specifically you white people in the audience, this is, this is key, okay? Pay attention to the tortilla. Don't just put it in the microwave. Don't just heat it, don't just heat it up. You gotta, you gotta treat that tortilla with respect, okay? The tortilla has like a... Like the Virgin family. de Guadalupe appears in tortillas. Yes. <laughs> it appeared on the hill of Tepeyac, right? Okay, so... Okay. So when you're making a taco, don't just... It's not a piece of bread. It's part of the experience. Make sure you get a little fat from the meat or a little oil from the veggie vegan tacos that I make. And uh, you... <laughs> I totally ate bacon this morning. Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> You put that tortilla on the pan where you cook the meat and, 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 and make sure that it's warmed up. Sometimes if it's a little crispy too, it's perfect. So there's nothing <coughs> worse than a cold tortilla on a taco. Right? Am I right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. So um, anybody, anybody have any shout outs for any good food places around here for all our listeners that are gonna come visit the Berman Museum after this. Shagoon Fine Indian Cuisine. Yes, there's some fine Indian, what is it called? Shagoon. Shagoon, they have, they have a buffet, they're really good. The syrup in their uh, Coke machine is like on point, <laughs> like the, like the uh, bubbles to syrup <laughs> ratio. <laughs> it's perfect, it's great. I love that. So I, we should stop talking about food for a second. Yes. And I think we should get into some terms because we use this language and I don't think a lot of people are familiar with some of the things we, we are talking about. So how many, for example, of you have heard the, learn, um, the term Latinx as opposed to Latino or Latina? Oh, that's good. Every time we have a presentation, there's more and more people into it. Yeah. Um, um, the term Chicano, for example, or Chicanex. So these are terms that in the Latinx community we, we, we use a lot, but I don't think a lot of our listeners exactly what it is. So why don't we start with Latinx? Yeah, so we are Latinos who lunch, and I, I think that um, when we started the podcast, the term Latinx wasn't in vogue yet. It was just starting. It was yeah. just starting. I think one of our first episodes was with another podcast, and we discussed the term. And so Latino, let's just start with that term. Latino or Latina is a general term to describe somebody that's Latin American. Specifically, it lives in the U.S. It lives in the U.S. Otherwise, you reference to as Latino, Latino or Latino Americano. Latino Americano, right? Yeah. So it's kind of an umbrella term, um, and so adding the X to Latino or Latina uh, makes it gender inclusive. So it's uh, Spanish is a uh, gendered language, basically. So right. everything is Latina or Latino, right? Um, so. Um, I've heard that Latinx is a very popular term, and I think it's because it looks really great in the hashtag. Um, and I think that, I don't know if you would agree, Pablito, but the internet is changing language at a very rapid pace. Right. Um, before, uh, I noticed uh, that pop culture would do that, right? Like Beyonce, uh, Destiny's Child, for example, uh, they coined the term bootylicious, and it made it into the dictionary <laughs> after a few years, right? That's right. Um, Beyonce says conversate. Instead of converse, we say conversate, right? Whatever Beyonce says is we law. Yes. So, um, 
And that's happening now with academia and the internet. There's a lot of pushback because academia, right, colleges, where you're at now, they are uh, bubbles. They are kind of bubbles, but they're also uh, the people that are shaping language and, and changing, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just, just like developing our language, right? Or, or at least writing about it. And so um, with this Latinx term, I, think, I feel like there was a lot of pushback. It was the opposite. So in fact, um, adding the X, it's a nod to Nahuatl, to the language of the Aztecs. Ooh. So for example, Mexico, the original way of pronouncing it is Mexico, for example. And the X, it's, it's a nod to that. So adding the X became problematic for a lot of Latin Americans because it wasn't necessarily inclusive to all the different countries. It was just Mexico-centric. Um, also, it's, um, there's differences in terms of generation. So older generations are not gonna refer to themselves as Latinx. Older gener I mean, it's not a generalization, but um, this happens a lot. So there was a lot of pushback. However, it, become, it became the language of activism because it was about gender in inclusivity. So now, <coughs> academia, it started to catch up. And that's one of the things, I feel like academia is going through an existential crisis because a lot of these things are happening outside of these bubbles that, that we're talking about. And now we have the opposite. We have the academia is looking into pop culture and then bringing it again or reanalyzing it or recontextualizing everything. I know, for example, of, of my, one of my advisors, he finished his book and then the term Latinx started to become popular. So he tried to get the script back from the publisher so he could change everything and he was not allowed to. And now every single book that is published that had deals with Latinx culture, you have to have the X. Otherwise, you um, it's it's not inclusive enough. So I think things are changing, and part of that is the internet. But um, yeah, and so Latinx is one of the main terms that we use now, and I feel like it's very inclusive. I've I've recently started reading the word Latine a lot, and Latine is an even bigger umbrella term. Um, so uh, it's the E at the end, and it actually makes more sense for there to be a vowel at the end when you're speaking in Spanish. Um, so I'm, I, and I, I think that it'll maybe catch on with Latinos um, a little bit better. Um, but there's other identifiers, and I, for example, am first generation uh, American. My parents immigrated here back in the 1980s. My mother's Guatemalan. My dad is Mexican. So I also identify as Mexican American, Guatemalan American, um, Southwestern, because I'm from the Southwest United States. Um, and then there's other terms uh, like Chicano. Um, and Chicano can be spelled in multiple ways, like Ch almost like Chicago, right? Chicano with the CH. Some people put an X instead of the CH. Because it comes from Mexicano. Mexicano. Yeah, Chicano. Yeah. So Chicano or Chicana, Chicanex, um, <coughs> making it gender inclusive again. Um, and so I guess the, the definition of that word is second or third generation Mexican American. Mexican American. So Chicano is very specific. Um, and a lot of times, I'm technically not a Chicano because I'm first generation. <laughs> but I will be curated into a lot of Chicano shows because of the nature of my artwork that's done in a piñata style, um, so it fits with a lot of these shows. And for a long time, as an artist, I kind of stayed away from identifying as Chicano because technically I wasn't one, and I identified more with my Central American roots, my Guatemalan roots growing up, and I didn't want to like be a poser or whatever, but. Look at me now, <laughs> the biggest person out there. So um, I've, I've learned to embrace the Chicano identifier because of the Chicano community so good, yeah. who has like embraced my artwork and, and I feel like they see that I'm like respecting it and not exploiting it, which is a really thin line when you make art about your identity. Um, so um, there's another word. Well, there's, there's, there, that I, that we don't really use. We don't like Do you want to talk about that word? Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say um, that these sort of terms are politically contingent. So if the U.S. government decides that we are white, which they did for decades, we were, we were in the census, for example, you check 
the race white, and the category was Hispanic, which I don't like that because that ties, I mean, at least in my terms, but that's because I'm a nerd, studied colonial art. That ties me to the legacy of the colonizers, and um, I don't like it. So what does Hispanic mean? Hispanic means from the country that speaks Spanish. So when people call it Spanish rice, and that shit has jalapeno, like that makes me really mad. Like that's Mexican rice. It's Hispanic, Spanish, that's two different things. I could be, I don't know, Antonio Valderas, so of course, you're gonna call me, I mean, you know. But you can call me Spanish, but that's not the case. I'm Mexican, and it yeah. really bothers me. It bothers me that still today, I mean, this is what, we're in October, this is Hispanic History, Heritage, Heritage Month. Yeah. Yes, and it shouldn't be like that. It should be Latinx um, um, Heritage Month, but I don't know, like, that's one term that insults me a little bit, but I don't know how you feel about it. Um, I think that it, I, well, it was basically pushed forward by the Nixon administration back in the day um, on the census, and so I see that more as an agent of colonization or of trying to categorize us, which ties into a really deep art history of the caste system, which Babalito's gonna touch on in a little bit, um, but so are all the other identifiers. So is the word Latino, so is the word Chicano, so is the word. So the difference, I think, between Hispanic and Chicano is that I think those terms were uh, started to be used by the people that identify that themselves as that Correct. instead of being labeled that by a government or a government agency. Um, so this is how I see it. <laughs> Lay it out. <laughs> Latinos are Democrats, Hispanics are Republicans. <laughs> That's it. So, if you voted for Trump, you're a Hispanic. So, um, Amen. Shout out to Marcel's Pizza, by the way. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> don't eat there if you're brown. Okay, so, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, there's other, there's, uh, there's, and another thing about Hispanic is that it totally excludes a lot of Afro-Caribbean uh, cultures that don't speak Spanish. It also excludes uh, Brazilians who speak Portuguese. Um, and so the word Latino is a is I, I like to use Latinx because it is a more umbrella term. A lot of Brazilians actually that I've talked to reject uh, uh, the word Latino also or Latinx. Brazilian. They're very proud to be from Brazil. Yeah, that makes sense. But see, as you mentioned, all of these terms are, it's, it's, a, it's a very historic thing. People, when they talk about Mexico, and I heard this from a lot of Mexicans, they say, oh no, we don't, we don't have race problems in Mexico. We're all <laughs> Mexicans. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, um, but the, the, the idea is that we were conquered, we were colonized, not conquered. Um, we were colonized by the Spanish. When the Spanish arrived to, to the Americas, they created a system called the caste system. So there was different levels of a caste system in, in, in Mexico and all of um, and pretty much all of Latin America. And the closer you were to Spanish <coughs> blood, the more rights you have and your caste will be more respected. The farther away you were from Spanish blood, the more ridiculous your caste name will be. So one caste name that I can think about is um, um, John Packard, Salta Patras. That was the name of your caste. And if you happen to have even an aunt of African blood, because a lot of people forget this, but in Mexico we have African ancestry, we have Latin American, we have Aztec, we have everything. Once you had African blood in your system, you were part of the lower caste and you can never go back to become Spanish with different generations. If you just mix with indigenous people, it will be different. But it gets more complicated in the United States because there's like a binary system here that is black and white and everything in the middle. In Mexico, no, in Mexico there was the purity of blood of Spanish and the purity of blood of indigenous people. But only certain indigenous people. Which ones, for as a general rule, anybody that helped the Spanish conquer the Aztecs will have special rights. So they will be considered um, purity of blood. So if you combine the, um, our Asian backgrounds, our African backgrounds, our European backgrounds, our pure and not pure indigenous backgrounds, and then you tie class into that, what you get is a mess. It's a mess, and it's hard to classify. So when people talk about race in Mexico, I don't even think we should use that word. It's so complicated. But we do have a system of classifications. You have the French and the Enlightenment to thank for that. And, um, and we're still dealing with that. 
to the point that a caste system, for example, in Mexico, you could fill up to 200 different classifications. In the census, every 10 years in the United States, you have about that. You have about 200 different classifications. So in a way, nothing has, um, nothing has changed. And it really affects not only the way that we communicate each other, because race is something that we do to each other, right? Mm -hmm. But it affects policy, because we see it every day, especially with this public administration. Yes. Yeah. And something, so more on the, on the caste system or caste system, uh, if you go to a museum, usually if they have a Spanish colonial section, they will always have caste paintings because they were so common in Latin America. Mm -hmm. They're literally painting, sometimes they're like about this big, like, uh, like two feet by two feet, and it shows a couple and a child. So, uh, for example, a mestizo, which is a term that a lot of people still use, yeah. is Spanish and Indian, and the result is a mestizo. So you will have father and mother and then the little kid at the bottom. It's almost like the holy family type of, of painting. So it works from the bottom, which is usually black people, because that's still the case in still in this country and all over the world. And then it goes all the way up to the whitest Spanish. of the white in, yeah. in Mexico or in Latin America that happens to be Spanish. And there were about 16 categories of caste that were made it into paintings. And then after that, they, you were not considered part of the caste system. Um, at, at least in images. And those images will be consumed by the Spanish. And this, that's how people started, not started, but like, that's how people exoticize Mexico, which is still a problem today. There's like a whole visual culture of the way that Europe has exoticized Mexico, the way that we have been portrayed as violent, as lazy, as barbarians. Those are still stereotypes that we're dealing with today. And in a way, they have been around for 500 years. Yeah, so, uh, a big message with Latinos Who Lunch, and we always talk about it on our podcast, um, a lot of people, specifically white people, will say this term, and if you're a person that says this term, <coughs> stop saying it because it's racist and white supremacist. I don't see color, right? If you don't see color, well then maybe you're blind, um, <laughs> because we need to see color, right? It's a reality. Uh, it's, a re it's, it's a reality. You can pretend that you don't see color, but you, everybody sees color, right? And we should see color, and we should acknowledge color, and we should use our privilege as m myself uh, doing this podcast. I, did, I thought I was super Mexa, super Guatemalan, and people started asking me if I was Mexican, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I am a white passing Latino, depending on where I am in the world. Um, so I didn't recognize that privilege because I'm white, right? So um, when white people uh, realize that privilege, that's when you can start actually doing good and ending racism, right? So acknowledging color is actually a way to, is the beginning to the end of racism, right? Pretending it doesn't exist never solves anything, right? It, it put, maybe it puts a band-aid on it, make, maybe it, it, it lets you sleep better at night, but it's never the solution. <laughs> For anything, I smoke a lot of pot sometimes to fall asleep at night. That is a solution, sometimes, right? So because it's I, legal, in the it's Nevada. legal. It's legal in Nevada. Calm down, everybody. So um, yes, um, there's this place right by my house. Oh my god, it's like a music video in there. They call them butt tenders, and they're like these sexy ladies, like in lab coats, with like the, it's very problematic. But it's like a Snoop Dogg video in there, and um, anything they sell me, I'm just like, yes, I will have the lemon poppy seed uh, vape. Sure, I'll have it. Great, I'll take it. I'll take three of them. Perfect. Okay. Anyway, don't travel with them. Uh, it's not a good idea. They'll put you in a room for a while. Okay. But another way that um, the caste system affects things is um, art. So yes. for example, in, the, in Mexico, if you were of Spanish blood, you could make religious images. <coughs> but if you were not of Spanish blood, you were not allowed to. And that affected the whole entire colonial period that after Mexico gained its independence in 1821, they established an art academy <coughs> prior to that. And the art academy only allowed Spanish or Creole artists to, to work. And that's where we get, for example, artists like Jose Maria Velasco that, that you work with, who had the privilege of working under the academy 
and they were allowed to make images that still have an impact today. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that, about why you chose, for example, artists like Jose Maria Velasco, and why are they representative to you, to the idea of being Latinx or Hispanic? Yeah, so right now, for our listeners, uh, we are sitting in a room uh, that is a full-on installation, and it is a blown-up version of a Jose Maria Velasco painting from the 19th century um, that is part of the Pfeiffer Wing here at the Berman Museum at Ursinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, I was really attracted to the paintings of Jose Maria Velasco, and if you haven't seen them and you're here in the audience, uh, if you go upstairs, I believe there are books with his paintings, so you can see the paintings that I'm referencing uh, with this installation. This is uh, the Valley of Oaxaca uh, that is being uh, displayed here. Um, and when I first saw these paintings, I was actually sitting in on one of Babalipo's courses at UNLV, uh, Mexican Art History, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really, uh, I was really- You were Snapchatting. I'm not. Well, Snapchat is dead. Don't use it anymore. <laughs> Rihanna said. So, um, I don't. It's, it's for little kids now. I can't even. I, there's too many filters. I don't know what's happening. So, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know what? You know. Okay. So we're like in our early 30s. Say it. I'm not. I'm late 30s. I'm yeah. So. Uh, um, it's, I've gotten to the point where like I'm mad at Instagram because they keep fucking it up every single day. And I'm like, I don't understand what kind of filters on here. I miss the old days. And then I was at a bar in New York the other day, and I said, the music's too loud in here. <laughs> like, it's, it's you have crossed the threshold. Yeah, I'm just gonna stay home now. Okay, so you were sitting in my class. Okay, and great, chat. great. Yes. And I saw the work of Jose Maria Velasco. And it, they're beautiful paintings, almost like a postcard. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've been to that part of Mexico, and it doesn't look, doesn't look like anything that. like that, right? So I was really taken aback by the romanticization, mm -hmm. right, of, of Mexico. And um, this almost European, well, this very European style of painting that was portraying Mexico. Um, and, uh, and then I started thinking, like, um, so these, these paintings were made to attract Europeans, because it was made in a European style, to come to Mexico to continue the colonization of Mexico. So it was basically a tool of the government. Yeah, and also, in fact, this painting right here, the Valley of Oaxaca, was exhibited in the 1893 Chicago Expo. And it won medals for that reason. So in a way, after 1820, because the, Mexico was close, you couldn't go into Mexico. You needed a special permit from the king. After 1821, anybody, the doors were open. So this was a way for the government to invite people to intervene. It's like, we have this vast landscape. You can construct. Mexico is open for, for business, basically. And when you look at these paintings, there's always little details that remind you of Mexicanidad, or the idea of being Mexico. So a lot of, for example, you did some copies upstairs and you see um, the hill of Tepeyac, where the Virgen de Guadalupe appeared. You see the towers of the cathedral. You see machinery or the train going through the landscape. It's about progress. It's about symbols of Mexico, because Mexico didn't have symbols according to their history. They said, well, which is our new independent nation? What does it mean to be Mexican? So they made up all of this whole story that we're all Aztecs, <laughs> and now we've run with it. And part of that movement of creating the, the, the image of what Mexico is supposed to be, that's where Jose Maria Velasco comes into, into place. And now you go to Mexico City, he's probably one of the most important artists. He is everywhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I looked at these things and then I started to, I was making a lot of objects in the shape of piñatas. And when I first started making my work, uh, I actually stayed away from making art about my identity for a long time because I knew that as soon as, as, a, as, as a brown artist, as a person of color making art, um, once you start making art about your identity, there's no turning back because in the art world, um, 
They box you. They, they really box you in. And uh, I was afraid of that because I wanted the privilege of just making whatever I wanted and just talking about my work formally like most other white artists, right? But uh, once you start making work about your identity, your work is about your personality. It's about your biography. It's about your trauma, really, right? <laughs> um, and, shout out to Frida. Yeah, shout out to Frida. Um, so, um, she really, she did a great job doing that. So, <laughs> um, shout out to Salma Hayek too. So, <laughs> um, where was I going with that? Trauma. Trauma. Oh my God, so much childhood trauma. Yeah. So we're not going to talk about that now. Um, so, but, but then I saw, I, I started to see the, the, uh, the form in which I made art as a way to not only uh, show my identity, like have a symbol for my identity with a piñata, but also to like reclaim that as my own. So then I started thinking, okay, I'm going to take these paintings and I'm going to put little pieces of paper in this popular media because a piñata is like something that everybody knows in America, right? Um, so then I started making these paintings and at first um, they were maybe like a celebration, but then uh, it's really, when you look at them now, it's kind of a breakdown. It's really breaking down these images into pixels um, and kind of inviting you into the space. So a lot of my work is about visibility because visibility is essential. Yes, and it leads to true representation. And it's also about like taking up space, like literally taking up space on, in institutions, on white walls, where usually you don't see a lot of color. So, um, so uh, nice thank you, thank you so much. You got to see what I did there. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. So now this is kind of known as my signature technique, and you can, and, and just like Jose Maria Velasco's paintings, you can just see them as beautiful landscapes. You can see this as a beautiful, fluffy, romantic installation, or you can dig a little deeper and say, like, oh, okay, like. What, what is the history of a piñata? Like, okay, there's, uh, with piñatas, uh, it's tied, it's actually tied to colonization, colonization. Uh, because the piñata was used as a ceremonial object during Lent for, for Catholics, right? It, it had the seven spikes on it, and it represented the seven deadly sins, and then they would blindfold you, that represented your faith in Jesus, and then you would break the piñata, and that was your reward for being a loyal Catholic for Lent. Um, and then that eventually transferred to celebrating Christmas, Jesus' birthday, um, and then uh, every celebration. that just became like every celebration. Yeah. Uh, and there's also a really complicated history with the materials we use, like papel china, tissue paper, literally it's called Chinese paper in Mexico. Um, that came from Asia, that came from China uh, through uh, the trade routes. Um, the and, and Chinese people also had made, used to make effigies and like blow them up with fireworks and stuff. So a lot of Chinese traditions are actually Mexican traditions. Jalapenos, by the way, they came over from Asia. Hey, so you uh, something every day. And cilantro. So uh, <laughs> yes, that's why my mom identifies with a Chinese lady in, in China, Mama. Oh, they have entire that's conversations that's about their recipes through me. So, like she said that she was <laughs> and, oh my mom then I go back and forth my mom loves her but it's because the cilantro like yeah that out of plate Sichuan food <laughs> spicy Sichuan food with all the cilantro it's like Mexican food to me and to my mother yeah it's so good totally so I get it yeah so <laughs> great so yeah, that's so yeah so that's kind of the, those are the ideas that I am exploring <laughs> through this medium and also um, uh, I never thought I would be a muralist, but now technically I am because I cover entire walls, you know? So uh, in the great tradition of all these masculine artists <laughs> in Mexico, looking back at a wall and conquering it one brush stroke at a time, you know? Um, it's kind of a statement that I'm making now. But it's also, um, but it's also I see it that murals, as we mentioned in the podcast before, are the monuments of brown people. This is what yes. we record of history. Yes. So I see that you tying into that that history totally and 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 then speak and then the materials I mean we all know what paper feels like we all know like tissue paper uh, is also seen as a craft material it's also seen as like a feminine thing like decorating something um, so I like to play with those notions like what is craft 
what is fine art, you know, kind of thing. So, um, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but when people ask me, like, what do you identify as, I like to say that I identify as multiple things. So yes, I am Latino, um, I am Chicano, I am Guatemalan, Central American, Mexican, I am whatever you want me to be as long as the check clears. So, um, it's hard out here for an artist. So, um, so that also that also ties into my artwork. I want it to be accessible. If you think my artwork is craft, amen to that. That's great. Um, I'm doing an exhibition next year at, at in Houston at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Um, and then the next month I'll be at the Carter Museum in Fort Worth, right? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with those lines on purpose and I think people are finally paying attention and seeing that I'm making a statement uh, based on the materials that I'm using also. And it's also a testament, when, you, when I see people write about your artwork, I love it because either they exoticize you or they paint you as a fine artist because we work with those categories, coming back, we how I'm tying everything, because people work with those categories. So we have to be a fine artist or a craft artist or Latino artist or, or a white artist or a black artist. Like it always has to be something. You can never be just the idea of creating something for self-expression. Yes, mm -hmm. and you said a word that I think we should touch on, exoticization, mm -hmm. right? To exoticize something. Yes. So, has anybody here been to Mexico? Raise your hand. Awesome. Was it like anything that you've seen on TV about Mexico once you got there? Absolutely not, right? <laughs> it just depends on where you go. If you go to a resort town, yeah, it's going to look like a resort town anywhere you go. Shout out to Cancun. So, <laughs> but uh, if you really go to Mexico, you'll realize that there's a big difference. And so, um, there's a, there's a popular movie that just came out recently that we talk a lot about, and it's called Coco. Has anybody seen Coco here? Yes. yes. <laughs> so Coco, the movie Coco, is still doing the same thing that these Jose Maria Velasco paintings did. It's selling Mexico. Uh, it's the same thing that Frida Kahlo's work, Diego Rivera's work did, and it's, it's, it's just a continuation of that same legacy. So if you watch Coco, uh, you, it takes place in modern day uh, Mexico. Um, if you watch the movie, um, for some reason, Miguelito still has a VHS. I don't understand that. There's no um, cell phones. They're more expensive than DVD players. Right. So why would he have that? There's no cell phones. I don't. I think I saw maybe one car, like one truck, yeah. in the whole town. Everything was made out of Adobe trolleys. <laughs> yeah, there's trolleys. Yeah. Uh, so there's pyramids. In the afterlife. Actually, the afterlife is more modern. If you if you watch the movie, the afterlife has computers, and the town where they live in it doesn't have computers yes. and synthesizers and like keyboards yeah. compared to the town where Miguelito's from, which is based on a few towns like Guacachula and a couple places in Michoacan, yeah, like, which we've been to. And I'm like, if you go anywhere. I mean, if you go, people have computers and cell phones everywhere, especially, I mean, they got their YouTube playlist going, you know. Um, the telenovela the telenovela. Yes. Yeah. So it's these same tropes that keep being repeated within our history and in popular media that we see today. And that keep boxing us within the same category. Yes. 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 And that's what happens when you don't see these things. You don't, <laughs> you don't see color. Yeah. So this is the, so now this is the part of the podcast where we normally recommend things. We try to recommend a podcast or music, but when we do this type of events, we allow the audience to ask us questions so we can feel a little bit of the conversation. So but before we do that, we're going to take a little break. Oh, we should take a break. Yes. Yeah, give us a little commercial break music. Okay, 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 okay. This is where we enter the commercial. And we're back. Okay. <laughs> we're back here live at the Berman Museum at Ursinus College in beautiful Collegeville, Pennsylvania. So now, <laughs> so again, this is the part of the of the live podcast where we want to open the dialogue with our with our guests and. If you guys have any questions about what we just talked about, 
or anything about the podcast, we'll be more than happy to to, to start. Yeah, so we we want to have like a, just a discussion, like just let's have a fun. And well, it doesn't have to be fun, but let's just have a discussion. Um, so don't be shy. Even if you have a dumb question, those are my favorite. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Testing? It says it's on. Excuse me, Mr. Sound person? Hello? Is that on? Oh, awesome. Okay, can anybody have a question? I have all this. Yeah. Tell us about the shirt. Oh, this? Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, I always wear the same outfit, um, and it is my uniform. It's like a. I'm paying homage to most of my family because most of my family works in Las Vegas in the casino. So my mother is a porter, she cleans the casino. And my grandmother was a maid for years and years. And so I always wanted to have a, a uniform to represent me as an artist, like when I went to work. Um, and it, I started wearing a skeleton shirt a long time ago. Um, it was my favorite shirt, and I just saw that I would wear it to all my openings, just like subconsciously, like being drawn to it. And then when I saw the ties, I think the Book of Life had come out, and I went to Mexico and was there for Day of the Dead, and saw how like Americans were appropriating Day of the Dead. Uh, I started to wear it just to like make a statement, and then I wear red, uh, always a red sweater. My grandma always wore a yellow cardigan, um, but I, I do this, my signature red sweater is based on actually Mr. Rogers, because I grew up watching Mr. Rogers every day, and he was like a really important figure in my life, even though um, he wasn't, I mean, he's a real person, you know, like, <laughs> I never met him or whatever, but um, he, uh, he was just a very kind person that, you know, has anybody seen Mr. You guys are all so young. Do you know who Mr. Rogers is? Oh, there's a documentary now, right? So everybody knows. Okay. Well, I don't need to talk about it. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Awesome. Thank you, guys. This is the first time that I see you, that I hear you. Um, I am originally from Columbia. I'm visiting from Miami. Um, who do you think is the ideal demographic that you want to reach? I feel like when you speak, I'm like, yes, like I know exactly what you're saying. I'm a Spanish speaker, that's my mother tongue. Um, I'm an immigrant. Uh, do you think that this podcast or this types of conversations are more for us, in a way, or they're just a little bit more inclusive? Like, who, who are you trying to reach with these types of conversations? I mean, we want the podcast to be for everybody, but really the, we did this podcast for us. So we, when people ask us, where do you want to be? How, how popular do you want to get? We always said, as long as we can continue this conversation with each other, and if other people can relate, that's awesome. We've been fortunate enough that we have been able to reach a lot to um, Latinx undergrads, especially Chicano undergrads in different parts of the country. They are the ones that are more involved in our conversation. However, we were first featured by one of our fellow podcasts called Super Mamas, and we gained this huge audience of, of Mexican mothers, of Latinx mothers. So I don't know, I don't know if I have a target goal, but I definitely do think that as long as you can see yourself reflected in our conversations and you can participate in the dialogue, that's what makes me happy. Yeah, I think that the way that we did are doing this podcast right now is maybe for a wider audience. Uh, and I think that when we are actually doing our podcast, our format has kind of evolved based on what our listeners have requested. Yeah. So at the very beginning when we did this com this podcast, we said, you know, we're just gonna have, it's gonna be a conversation between us two. Yeah. So don't need, let's not even, Invite let's not even uh, uh, like include the audience. Let's literally just talk to each other and record it. And then eventually we started getting a lot of listeners emailing us, so then it was more direct towards the listener. And now I feel like, uh, yes, most of our audience is Latinx, um, but uh, I, I think we just try to be like honest and have frank conversations. And sometimes our, our entire episodes are in Spanish, so they're really for us, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but we're not excluding anybody. If you want to sit in and listen, because that is how I've learned so much. Some of my favorite podcasts um, for example, I've lis I'm listening to a lot of podcasts uh, led by 
queer uh, women of color right now, um, and that's not who I am, but I like I love to listen to their perspective. Like, uh, there's this podcast called Marsha's Plate, which is three trans people, two trans women and a trans man, black, based out of New York, um, or the Queer Women of Color podcast, uh, Inner Hope Uprising is another really great one uh, that I've been listening to, and I just learned so much from their perspectives, and sometimes I'll even listen to white podcasts to see what they're thinking about. And uh, usually, uh, I don't listen that long. But, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, this American Life is great. So, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think, I think that, um, yeah, in the, in the very beginning, it was like, just for us. We're going to do this for us. And then it kind of evolved after that. Charlie has the mic, if anybody else has a question. Yeah. Charlie? Right here, right here. Oh, wait. How did you decide on the name of your podcast? Oh, we went back and forth for a while. We didn't know, and um, we knew that we wanted to eat <laughs> because we love to eat, and that's how this conversation started. Um, it was through coffee shops and taco shops. And we will always find ourselves staying there much longer than we needed, <laughs> having this conversation. So we knew that food was important. And food is the center of our culture, too. Everything happens in the, in the table. Um, and then we mentioned it to a friend after, um, what was the name of that class that we used to do? Oh my, we used to do this aerobics class called Mix Fit, which is like Zumba, but like hip hop. <laughs> so after Mix Fit, we told the concept to a friend, and a friend is like, oh, so like Latinos who lunch, like ladies who lunch, and we're like, wow! Yes! <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. It just came to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's talk right there. Talk. Um, well, just so we can hear your voice on the podcast. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm queer and I'm also Mexican, and I prefer to use they them pronouns. And I was having a, a discussion with my Spanish teacher, Shuru, hey. um, the other day, about how I noticed that there aren't any gender neutral, I guess, pronouns or terms um, with the Spanish that I guess were taught at home and like in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's anything or like any more information that you two know about that involves like gender neutral terms in like Spanish that people identify with. It's a thing. I I think I, I don't remember somebody was talking about it in a podcast that we are struggling for all this inclusivity in English, but when it comes to Spanish, a lot of it doesn't doesn't translate at all. Everything has a gender, el vaso, la computadora. Um, so it's, it's, it, I think it's a conversation that is just now starting in Latin America. Because the, the Latinx, the, the word Latinx has become such a, not even, it's a cultural phenomenon. Where I've noticed that a lot of other cultures are starting to apply something similar. So I think we're gonna get there, we're slowly starting to get there, but those conversations in Mexico, for example, are just now starting. So we have to, I feel like we have to wait to see what's gonna happen. But I think that these conversations about queer culture in Mexico, even though they've been happening since the colonial period, in the popular realm, they're fairly new. But they're happening because of the internet. So I think that this sort of language inclusivity is gonna become a thing soon in Latin America. But I don't think we're there yet, to be honest. It's gonna take a long time. Mm -hmm. Especially these old school Mexicans, man. They don't like, they don't like to change. True. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I mean, and to be honest, it's 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 taken me a while to uh, just to be completely honest, like compare to respect people's choice of pronouns, right? Like, I, it still trips me up. I still have to think about it. it not as much as I used to mm -hmm. be able to, but it does it does take time, especially when you've been taught. From a very young age to identify so he, her, her age, right? Like, yeah. um, um, now I have a lot of gender queer or, or non-binary friends, so I'm getting more used to it. But it just takes a little bit of time. But like Pablito and I have mentioned on our podcast, like imagine trying to explain the term Latinx to your grandma. She'd be like, Yeah, I don't have to pay the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so it's it, it's gonna take a while, and it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be our generation that starts to shift that. And even even like I mentioned before, having Latine, because you can do that. You can do that with any word in Spanish. I think that's gonna start changing. And you see some people starting to use yes, that. Um, yes. But it's it's very few. Yeah, adding the e. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You had a question. Hello. Hi, Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I wanted to say that it's evident that um, color is a big part of your exhibition, but I wanted to ask what role does color play um, in Guatemalan and Mexican cultures, um, be it in reference to holidays or food. I just wanted to ask about you know, the importance of color. That is a big thing. I, I, just, I just came back, when I came back in the summer, I was in public giving a workshop and it was two months of different scholars coming in and giving different workshops and the theme was color. And my role was to show a little bit of the history of color in, in, in Latin American art, specifically Mexican art. And one of the ties that I found was how, for example, in the pre-Columbian world, everything was alive, right? So a plant, a flower was tied to a ritual that was tied to the ritual calendar, that was tied to the universe, uh, a god or a goddess, it was tied to the universe. So color had this universal meaning. When the Spanish arrived, they erased that. So the first murals that were created, that if you notice, in Mexico, they're all black and white. However, um, the idea of color through the Spanish became a way to exoticize indigenous people. They're part of the land. They're color for people. So it's a very fine line to be able to appropriate those ideas and make them your own, like Fabi's doing. But at the same time, the idea of the colorful has become a vehicle to exoticize Mexico because of its colonial, because of its colonial roots. And I have a whole PowerPoint about how flowers, for example, the, the, the Virgen de Guadalupe appeared to this Nahuatl person. His name is Juan Diego. And the actual painting was created by a, Span uh, 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 a Nahuatl artist, um, Marcos de Zipac. But history denied that. They said, no, the Virgen de Guadalupe was painted by God through an indigenous person. So now you have all these paintings in the 17th century of Juan Diego holding a palette full of flowers. Because that was a way to connect with the Virgen de Guadalupe and with nature and to make indigenous people colorful. So it's a very, it's a very fine line that we have to play because we are powerful, colorful people and we are colorful culture, but what colorful means for me may be different from other, from other people. And it's also, it's also, I've noticed something that I see a lot in the art world is like this idea of like what's in good taste, what's in bad taste. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons that I don't like to have any negative space in my work. I try to fill everything with color, if you notice in here, there's actually no white in this installation. The lightest color is this like yellowish vanilla color. Um, so, uh, and I, I think back to um, when I was growing up and um, especially when you live in a place like Las Vegas that's based on tourism and being a person in the service industry, um, as a immigrant, as a person of color, as a servant, to be honest, you're taught to make yourself smaller, and you're taught to like go into a room, survey the room, see what needs to happen, see who needs help, uh, and be quiet, right? So I see the use of color as self-expression and also as a rejection of assimilation. Because a lot of people that come here from other countries immediately change what they're wearing because they don't want to stick out. Um, and, and it's, it's cross-cultural. Anybody that comes here to the United States starts to change the way that they dress. Um, and I'm, I've been in New York uh, for uh, almost three weeks now, and I, I even notice it there. Like, a lot of people will just wear black just mm -hmm. because they don't want to be seen. They just want to hide, you know what I mean? Um, and, like, me wearing a bright, even though I do wear all black because uh, you know, I'm dead inside. Uh, wearing wearing a bright red wearing a bright red sweater is is that statement. Like, yeah, I'm gonna wear this, um, even though it, it might not be in the best taste. I need to get a brighter one. I feel like I need to wear more colors. All right? I do too. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. We have one question in the front here. Hi. I'm 
I want to know if you're being any like attention to like Mexico or Central America because of your artwork, or do you think it could like reach that level? I to to show it there? Yeah, or like just like in general. Um, yeah, I, I actually just showed in Mexico for the first or second time this year, so uh, I think the work is getting a little bit more attention there, which actually makes me super happy because a lot of times, just to be honest, my work is seen as an exoticization of Mexico. It's like seen as the same thing as that, that we're kind of like fighting against, fighting against yeah. you know? But they don't look away, they don't look beyond the surface. They don't look past the surface of it, right? Um, which is funny because this work is all about the surface. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I have, I'm actually in a show right now in Puebla, Mexico with this organization uh, called Archetopia that Babalita has been a part of. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a, a politically charged show, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I, I'm actually taking a trip to Guatemala in January because I'm trying to I'm trying to connect with my Guatemalan family a little bit more because even now that I'm aware of like um, people only identifying me as Mexican, I have started to to just to to like bond more with my Mexican side of my family. Also, like make work specifically about Mexico. So I'm excited to go to Guatemala to just reconnect with my Central American roots. But then there's also that fine line of like, am I gonna be this person going in and looking at all these exotic people in colorful clothes and making art about that? I don't wanna do that either, you know? So, um, yeah, uh, I, would, I would actually love to sh show more in Latin America. And I actually had a huge lesson when I was in Mexico and did an artist residency there because I was making piñata sculptures and put, putting them out on the street as interventions. <laughs> and Mexicans were like, why the fuck? Like, they didn't even, they're like, oh, a pinata hanging in the street in Mexico. Nobody saw it. Like, it's just part, it just looks like it's part of the landscape. And I'm like, oh my god. Like, nobody sees my art here, right? So that was a big wake up call for me. Yeah. Right where are you too? What part of the world are you? Um, all over. So the first week I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do the tourist thing, and like we're, my cousin and I are just gonna go all over the country and see all of the all of the things white people see, like the ruins, and the lakes, and the whatever. And, and then we're gonna go to Guadalajara, where my family's from, like, and and they're they're from this tiny little place in the jungle called the Cubilete. Yeah. No, in Guatemala. Guatemala. In Mexico. My dad's side of the family, they're from Durango, Mexico. So they're from the north, um, landlocked, yeah. Yes, yes. That's right, I think I'm, we're gonna go there, yeah. Are you going to Mala? Yeah. <gasps> yes, Chapina! Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Oh my gosh, okay, can I ask you a question? Is there a big... There's this restaurant, I want to give a shout out to Guatemalan Kitchen in Phoenixville. Have you been there? I've been there, I've been wanting to. Is it, there's a big Guatemalan community here, right? Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not from I mean, maybe I saw them all there. In Phoenixville? Yeah, yeah I noticed, I noticed. I saw like La Chapina or something. Yeah. Let's go right now. Awesome, okay. Okay. I'm down. Okay. Great. I'm feeling bougie. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay, any more questions? One more. All right. Um, I am Sochi Chu. And uh, I've been at her sinus. I came in 2000. And now um, I'm pleased to say that we have more Latinx students, um, which brings, um, as a professor of Spanish, um, it, I think it's difficult for uh, what is designated as Spanish heritage speakers, meaning students that have learned Spanish at home, but not officially learned it as from a grammar text. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about that as to, uh, because I see the frustration, um, and I'm trying to, <laughs> so <blessed. Yeah. laughs> I'm incorporating Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. An observation. Um, unfortunately, I used to teach at UNM, um, and I used to teach Hispanic heritage speakers, Hispanic heritage speakers, <laughs> but that's another thing. 
Um, That's a whole so, other month in yeah. Mexico. Yeah. So um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have, or we don't have the population here for me to teach um, using other teaching methodologies. So could you speak a little bit as to the use of Spanish specifically in different um, uh, venues, yet welcoming everyone the different types of Spanish? Yes. Does that make sense? I can talk, I can speak on that. I just had, recently I had um, some experiences. I'm very, as they say, pocho in the way that I talk. Like, um, I, I, Spanish was my first language and then like at five, I just started watching TV all day, and that's how I learned to speak English. And um, I've kind of, I kind of lost it a little bit. So uh, I do have like a seven-year-old's conversational Spanish vocabulary. It's, um, more than it's a little bit more, yeah. But uh, it takes me a while for my brain to like switch over to full-on Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. And then also the fact that. Uh, I had a Guatemalan accent growing up because I was raised on my mom's side of the family and then my Mexican side would make fun of me for having a Guatemalan accent because racism is real. So uh, so then um, uh, I was always aware of it and just like English just became easier for me to, to speak. Um, and on the podcast I am an advocate for people like me who are ashamed of the way that they speak because they're not looked at as like an authentic Latino or Hispanic or whatever you identify as. So um, I, I, fight, I fight against that a lot uh, just because I feel like um, my identity and people that share the same identity, we matter and we're just as Latino as uh, anybody else that, right, that, that speaks Spanish and is from Latin America. We were just colonized by different people. So, um, I mean, so, uh, but saying that, I did a, I, I, I did a project in the Canary Islands in June, um, in Spain, when they spoke Spanish, Spain Spanish, you know, a lot of extra flourishes on their words over there. And I'm, I was like, I do not understand what you're saying. Can you speak slower? Even though they're speaking in Spanish, right? Um, and I realized, um, just from my artist, like you know, just business perspective, uh, that I could not, I they did not understand my Spanish, and they didn't know what I was saying. And even when I'm speaking with my family and, and I'm describing my artwork, um, it takes me se me la lengua. Like I don't know what I'm saying, right? So um, I started actually doing Duolingo in Spanish just to like learn Spanish again and actually um, uh, learn how to write it and, and it's important. It's just a, it's, it's a tool. Um, I, was a, I, I, I will admit I was a hater for a long time, but if it's something that's gonna help you communicate better uh, to a wider audience and it's gonna help me make money because uh, <laughs> you know, it, Ain't nothing going on but the rent, you know. So, uh, it it I, I've kind of changed my tune. I still respect people that are pocho as fuck like me, but I also understand the importance of uh, of, of of paying attention and and actually trying to communicate in Spanish with people. And you know what? I respect, for example, my grandmother who ref I know she knows how to speak English. She's been in this country for over fifty years. And she will not, right? She refuses to speak uh, English. Yeah. yeah, and your mom too. Shout out to Grandma. Yes, she's amazing. She refuses to speak English, which is great because if we're doing, if we're like gossiping and the cheese is in English, like she is listening. I can tell. She's <laughs> like, um, so that's also that's her way of, of 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 using that in her benefit. So there's many sides to it. But I do, I, I, now I do see the value of actually learning Spanish. So you can at least see if somebody's taking advantage of you or not, right? <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and that being said, that was our official podcast live at the Bourbon Museum. <laughs> I have I had an amazing time working here, Pablito. The same. I um, I think that 
it is spaces like this that appreciate our worth and appreciate our work that really push us to continue doing this type of project. So thank you, everybody. Really. Yes, thank you all so much. It's been a great experience. Okay, now I have to do the closing part. Since it is recording, so I don't have to do it later. Okay. <clears throat> And as always, you can visit us at latinoswholunch.com. Email us, asklwlpod at gmail.com, and we might answer your questions on a future episode. If you have a moment, please donate. If not, at least leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Five stars. Five stars only. Because the more reviews we have, the more visible we are. And visibility leads to representation, and representation is essential. Today's episode was produced by Justin Favela and Emmanuel Ortega. Music by the band Brown Out. Shout out to the Berman Museum of Art in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. I'm Bobby Fah. And I'm Bobby Bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao.